Here we are, part two of uh, this lecture about the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, the one that we reside in. So the first part was a good bit about like the structure of the galaxy, where we are in the galaxy, kind of stuff. Uh, I think we're going to start out here by looking at the center of the galaxy. Right, that was a sort of like bulge area, the center of the galaxy. There's like this bar, very center of that. This is an image looking towards the center of the galaxy and pretty much in the middle ish of that line about where the center of our galaxy is and that sort of level or that line where all this material is all this kind of dark stuff light stuff that's the plane of the galaxy this is looking towards the center and i think i'm going to show a nice little video that sort of zooms in a bit on that area and this image right now is invisible invisible light and so as we look in, there's a lot of dark areas there, and that's just the visible light that we would see as being blocked by all this interstellar gas and dust and such. So the video will zoom in, see the visible, and then it'll kind of transition and show the same area in infrared. And we'll get an idea of how much more infrared penetrates through all that gas and dust, and it allows us to see through. I also mentioned before, uh, radio waves work really well for looking through all the interstellar gas and dust, too. So similar to how infrared, you'll see, kind of penetrates through, radio does that really well also. There we go. Zooming in. And we're going to close in on a box there. Oh, this is nice. That's like the constellations, roughly where the center of the galaxy is. It's near Sagittarius and Scorpius, or in that direction at least. So this is still invisible, and it gets really dark. A lot of areas you can't see much, but look in infrared instead, and a lot of that dark stuff disappears. We can see a lot more, right? You see a lot of the stars that are actually there. You generally, just get kind of a different picture in the infrared, see through a bit more stuff, and then you know there's other stuff that you might still not see through or might not even see in the visible at all and only comes out in infrared. So this is then an image taken in the radio portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and it's a pretty close area, a pretty close-up image of the center of the galaxy. So that bar is about 240 light years and there's like three or four of those almost roughly like a thousand light years across here. Very roughly. So some things to notice, you know, like the very center of our galaxy is this really bright area on the right-hand side that's actually labeled Sagittarius A, little star there. And so that's pretty much the center of the galaxy. And it's actually emitting quite a lot of radio waves. That's why it's so bright. The brighter areas are actually emitting a lot of radio. There's a good bit of other stuff around, features, and the book has an image that's kind of like this. I didn't really like it. There's just too many things pointed out on there and not really explained. And we're not going to go into detail into a lot of these other features, partly because they're really complicated and we don't actually really understand a whole lot about most of the stuff going on here. So yeah, this is a simplified version. At least one that we know is that there are some supernova remnants around the center of the galaxy. And one is pointed out there, S and R is supernova remnant. So that kind of bubble there is like the um, outer layers of a massive star after it went supernova, blew off its outer shells, or outer layers. So in order to get an image this close, you need a really, really big radio telescope. Or, as I mentioned a long time ago when we were talking about telescopes, we're now able to use technology to sort of connect different telescopes, physically different telescopes together to sort of form a larger telescope. Um, like a virtual or effective larger telescope. So you can kind of collect uh, more radio waves than you would just one telescope, kind of connect multiple of them together. And this one is actually an array of like 64 telescopes in South Africa, part of like a meerkat experiment, I don't know, something like that. I also put on there this like dotted line, which is roughly the galactic plane, or the plane of the galaxy. And yeah, so right at the center is something that we call Sagittarius A star. So a lot of these things are termed Sagittarius something because in the night sky they're in the constellation Sagittarius, or very near Sagittarius. So this one was originally termed Sagittarius A star and more and 
recently it was discovered that right there is basically the center of the galaxy and there is an incredibly massive black hole in the center. What we call these really, really massive black holes, the supermassive black holes. This is like a category of really, really big black holes that I showed you at the very end of the lecture about black holes. And supermassive ones, it can be like millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. We'll talk more about ours here, Sagittarius A star. This is another image looking at the center of the galaxy. Similar scale, actually, to the one I just showed you. This is about 900 light years across. And Sagittarius A star, or the center of our galaxy, the supermassive black hole, I'm pretty sure is in the bright white area in the center of the image. And this is an image taken in the X-ray region, the electromagnetic spectrum, so they're very energetic electromagnetic waves. And again, the really bright areas are things that are emitting a lot of X-rays, or intense X-ray emitters. So that black hole is also an X-ray emitter. And if you remember, black holes tend to emit X-rays when they're eating up uh, material. Or when material is falling into it, that material can get really, really hot, and it can start giving off like bursts of X-rays or flickering in the X-ray region of the spectrum. This black hole is actually apparently devouring some material. And there's quite a lot of other little uh, point sources, just look like stars. And apparently those are generally white dwarves and neutron stars and other uh, stellar mass black holes. So when you say stellar mass, that's just like a normal black hole, a few times the mass of our sun. And then throughout the image, there's other sort of color, colored stuff in there. That's also gas, interstellar gas, or part of the interstellar medium. It's quite hot. It's hot enough to be emitting in the X-ray range as well. Very energetic place, the center of the galaxy. This is another look, sort of right around the center in the radio portion of the spectrum again. So the really bright area in the bottom right. It's a very strong emitter of radio waves. That's Sagittarius A star. It's another interesting sort of feature that you might have noticed in the other radio image that I showed you. It's this kind of like big line. Or I guess they call them uh, streamers, gas streamers. So it seems to be just big sort of streams of gas. And the book doesn't talk too much about these features, and I honestly don't know a whole lot about them. So I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. So like I told you, when you're looking at or looking for or trying to observe black holes, it's difficult, right? Because, for one, they don't emit any light themselves unless they're currently pulling material into them and that material is getting heated up and forming that accretion disk or the disk around it that is really hot and can emit x-rays. Right? We couldn't see that. But again, that kind of signal can be similar to other stellar objects. So one of the ways I told you that we do look for black holes is how those black holes affect the things around them. In particular, looking at like the orbits of objects that we do see and sort of assessing from these orbits, like there's something in this region that all these things are orbiting around, but we don't see that thing really, so it's a pretty good indication that that's a black hole. We're showing you an image on the left there, which is like um, actually a lot of data points put together, or a lot of you know, observations put together, and sort of time lapse. So all those dots are like evolving times for each of the half of these objects near the center of the galaxy. And when you put them together, you see that they form these orbits. They're pretty elliptical. And all the orbits seem to be kind of centered around some point right in the middle of the image there. You don't necessarily see anything there, but the fact that they're all orbiting around it is telling you that there's something very massive right there. A lot of mass. And this is an animation of basically very similar of that data there, or a similar sort of image, but kind of actually showing you the movement of some of these objects. And then in here, there's that little like uh, five pointed star that's actually on the point that is the center of the galaxy. And it was only fairly recently, very recently, that we got a picture or an image of that thing at the very center of our galaxy, we call Sagittarius A star that we are now fairly certain is a supermassive black hole. It's kind of fuzzy, but 
This is a, an image that was created by, I think it's called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And I think this image was only released maybe in 2022. Yeah, I think the observations were probably taken over quite a while. We're gathering up the data in order to build this image. It's taken over a few years, but we released this image just earlier this year, I think. I kind of hinted at this, but just to make it clear, it's a very crowded place at the center of our galaxy. There are thousands of stars within just a few light years, like a volume that's like a few light years wide, thousands of stars. Whereas like where we are out midway through like the disk, you know, it's like one star maybe every few light years. The next star to us is the Centauri star system, which is a few light years away. So the closer you get to the center of the galaxy, the more dense the stars are, and you're in the center of the galaxy, it's just very densely populated. So given the sort of picture and the animation that we saw on the last slide, how those objects are orbiting the center, along with uh, Kepler's third law, which has to do with like how long an orbit is and the masses of like the object and then the thing that it's orbiting. Given that information, we can assess that Sagittarius A star, that thing, is about four million times the mass of our sun. Very, very big, very massive. And then also, nicely enough, this supermassive black hole is currently eating or absorbing material, this kind of gas that's falling into it. And so kind of being able to see how wide the, that disk is of gas, that accretion disk, allows us to estimate how wide the black hole is, or at least how large its event horizon is. And so from data like this, we can estimate that it is about 50 million kilometers across, which is roughly the size of Mercury's orbit, or the orbit of Mercury. Incredibly massive, very large. Uh, so the image on the left there is the same image, but also drawn in is a dot about the size of our sun, relative to the size of this black hole, small, and then that circle is about the size of Mercury's orbit, okay, which is showing you that this thing is roughly the size of Mercury's orbit. So it's pretty incredible the technology and the collaboration that came together in order to get this kind of picture. As I mentioned, it's called the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, and basically they put together a series of radio telescopes or sort of connected them all over the planet in order to form a sort of planet-sized radio telescope. And you need that sort of thing because it's very difficult to see even with this much detail to the center of our galaxy. Given the, how far away it is, like the size of it, uh, I did a very rough calculation. This is sort of like taking a picture of something the size of like a virus. It's like 100, 200 nanometers. That is um, about a kilometer away. A kilometer, uh, three quarters of a mile, right? Something smaller than I can even see with my eye right now. That is almost a mile away. Yeah, pretty impressive uh, feat of technology. And so now we have another nice little uh, animation. This one again is zooming in on the center of the galaxy, but I think for the most part it's just showing in the radio. You can kind of zoom in and in, in. it gives you like a little bit of an idea of the size of this thing in terms of like the size of our galaxy and the center of our galaxy. So we start on visible and then transition to the radio image. Zoom in, radio, get sort of towards the centerish of the galaxy, and that's about the image that we were looking at earlier. You keep zooming in where that blob was in the image earlier, it's actually still quite a lot further in until we get about there. That Sagittarius A star. Supermassive black hole. So that's about all I'll say for now about our very own supermassive black hole. We'll talk a little bit more about the galaxy broadly. That should be good. So as I mentioned in the first part of this lecture, or in the lecture previous to this, the array of stuff, stars and gas and dust in our galaxy is mostly, like a lot of it, is sort of in this thin disk that uh, overlaps, like, that we call like the galactic plane. But there is also 
you know, some stuff that's above and below that plane, like the halo of the galaxy. So the image here is showing a really simplified, you know, kind of schematic of the galactic plane, and then the kind of orbits of stars in the disk, the thin disk of the galaxy. So pretty circular. That is as opposed to the things that are not orbiting in the plane of the galaxy, but are kind of off in all these different directions and are orbiting throughout sort of the halo of the galaxy. Those things tend to have a lot more elliptical orbits. And particularly here we're thinking about the stars now. So when we talk about the stars in our galaxy, come to sort of divide them into two very broad sort of uh, categories. We call it population one and population two stars. Now essentially the stars that are in the plane of the galaxy, or in the thin disk of the galaxy, orbiting around in nice kind of circles, uh, those are what we call population one stars. And beyond just being in the disk, most of those things are concentrated in the spiral arms of the galaxy. The stars that are not really in the plane and don't have nice circular orbits, uh, we call population two stars. So that's the ones on the right here. It's a little more about these populations, or the sort of characteristics that population one stars tend to have in population two stars. So again, population one in the plane, mostly circular orbit orbits, are going roughly in a circle around the center of the galaxy. Along with population one stars in the disk, that also tends to be where most of like the interstellar media of the galaxy is, so the gas and the dust that's part of our galaxy, and generally open clusters, open star clusters. So in general, population one stars tend to be younger stars, younger, very relative, it's like less than about 10 billion years old. Something else that I haven't focused on too much, we will mention a little bit here, and might come up more as we talk about other galaxies, is the amount of heavy elements in the stars in this population, or the amount of heavy elements in a thing in general. So when we talk about heavy elements, for astronomy, anything heavier than helium is just a heavy element. So the vast majority of stuff in the galaxy and the universe is hydrogen or helium. Mostly hydrogen, but some helium. So as it turns out, the population one stars, the ones that are sort of in the plane of the galaxy, they tend to have some heavy elements in them, which something like 1-4% to 4 of the star might be uh, elements that are heavier than helium. And just to be clear, our sun is a population 1 star, nicely in the plane of the galaxy. If we talk about population 2 stars, though, uh, those are the ones that are out of the plane, tend to be orbiting uh, elliptical orbits throughout the halo of the galaxy. These are generally much older stars, older being like more than 10 billion years old, and up to even like 13 billion years old. And these stars also tend to have much lower amounts of heavy elements in them than the population one stars. So if you recall, the way that we think heavy elements are made are generally by uh, stars going through their fusion processes, fusing hydrogen and helium and carbon and neon, and this sort of stuff up to iron. You get heavier elements that way, and then with a star, um, and it's light, it will kind of, one way or another, push all that stuff into uh, the interstellar medium, and that stuff can then go and become part of new stars. Uh, there's also, like in supernova, we think that the even heavier elements, heavier than iron, tend to be formed in supernova. So generally towards the end of a star's lifetime, uh, it will form elements that are heavier than iron, in one way or another. So you can kind of make sense of why the older stars tend to have less of these heavy elements. Right? Because they've been around for so long that when they were created, or when they first formed, there hadn't been a lot of stars already to make these heavier elements. So when they formed, there were just was less heavy elements around to incorporate uh, into themselves, into the stars where they are forming. Versus the younger stars, by the time you know, a few billion years later, some of these uh, old stars and stars that formed a long time ago will have gone through all their cycles already. You know, if they were really massive, they go through all their cycles really quick, and will have sort of seeded the interstellar medium with more heavy elements. So these younger stars uh, tend to have a bit more of their heavier elements than the much older ones. And it's also interesting to point out that it's actually some of these population two stars that give us a way to estimate the age of the Milky Way, right? the age of our galaxy. 
you think is something like 13 billion years old, right? That's about the oldest, or that's around the oldest age of stars that we can see, that we have found. It's kind of interesting because if you think back on estimating the age of our solar system, it was comets and asteroids that we used to estimate the age of uh, our solar system, right? The oldest things that had been around and hadn't changed much since the very beginning. So there's a similar idea here. Some of these really old population two stars in the halo have been around basically since the beginning of the galaxy. So as old as they are is about as old as the galaxy is. So like I said, we kind of broadly categorize population one and population two stars. But like most things, you know, it's not so simple as there's these kind and these kind. It's actually really more of like a spectrum from being a population one to population two. So that spectrum ranges from like stars that are very much in the planet galaxy to like being fairly out of the planet galaxy. And also stars that are like have circular orbits to being highly elliptical orbits, really squished orbits. So like from being younger to older, where that actually cuts off. It's not really a cutoff, it's a continuum. And even to like the amounts of heavier elements. Population one tends to have a higher portion of the heavy elements, but like it's a range when you get towards much, much lower amounts of heavy elements in these stars. So it's sort of like looking at a gradient, you know, this is a spectrum, say from like green to yellow. Like all the way on the left, pretty easy, that's green, you know, that's like population one. All the way on the right is yellow, population two. So we can kind of broadly say on the left here is green, on the right is yellow, but in, in fact, you know, if we look closer, we want to be more particular, it's actually a gradient in between. That's all to say, it's just not as simple as like population one and population two. These are just ways of categorizing things that are fairly useful, but we want to kind of remember that it's just a categorization. But the world is generally much more complicated than like this one and this one. Whole spectrum. And you can say something very similar about like the distinctions that I told you about in the structure of the galaxy. You know, whether something is part of the disk of the galaxy or whether it's part of the halo of the galaxy. You know, like there's a gradient there. It's not as simple as saying, oh, right here is where I cut off the things that are in the disk. Or even like, where is the center of the galaxy? Which is where is like the outer edge of the galaxy. And you know, these are all things that range from one to the other. It's just much easier to think about it in those stark terms. For our purposes, we can generally think about it in these like nice, simple categories. I just like to remind you guys that, eh, in fact, if we want to think about it more, it's not so simple. So this then is our neighboring galaxy, at least the largest of our neighboring galaxies. So I've mentioned there are sort of smaller satellite galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way. The large and the small Magellanic clouds or some. Um, but if we're looking at like what's the nearest like full on its own galaxy, that's Andromeda, right? Or it's also known as M31. And it seems to be a fairly similar galaxy to our own. It's a bit bigger than ours, um, but it's also a spiral galaxy and has pretty much all the similar properties. I'm not quite sure if it's a barred spiral. It doesn't quite look like much of a bar in this image, um, but I don't actually know off the top of my head. This is our nearest neighbor, but you know, at this point, we're able to look quite far out into the universe and we can see many, many galaxies, many, many galaxies. I think I've talked about this before, but it takes the light from this galaxy a certain amount of time to get to us. Right? Light travels very, very fast, but it's still a certain speed. Right? It's like 300,000 kilometers per second, or something like that. It's very fast, right? But it's not infinite. It takes time for the light to get from there to here. So when we look out at these galaxies and these things out very far in space, what we're seeing is the light that's finally reaching us and left. Uh, that object, like this galaxy, quite a while ago. Even when we look at the nearest star to us, it's a few light years away, so it's the light that's getting to us right now left that star a few years ago. So we're seeing the star a few years in the past, in a sense. The star is the star, right? We're just kind of getting that picture now. So the same thing applies when we look further and further out, right? We look out to neighboring galaxies. It's like hundreds of thousands of light years or even millions of light years then. And what we're seeing is that galaxy, you know, something like a few hundred thousand to like a million years ago. 
before that galaxy, that light left like a million years ago. We're just seeing it now. If you keep looking further and further out, we're sort of looking then further and further back in time. If you look at something that's a billion light years away, the light left that thing a billion years ago to finally get to us now. This becomes pretty useful because the whole process of like a galaxy forming and like evolving over time is an incredibly large time scale. These things are around for billions and like 10 billion years. So we can't just like look out and watch a galaxy as it evolves. On our time scale, like we're nothing, we're a blip. But what we can do is we can look further and further away from us and we're looking further and further back in time so that we see younger and younger galaxies. If we look very far out in the universe, we see like early on in galaxy formation. And if we start kind of looking closer and closer and closer, then we don't see like one galaxy as it's forming, but we see a bunch of different galaxies in their like stages of forming. Right? Very early, when you look really far out, you look a bit closer, these galaxies have been around a little bit longer, so they're a little further along in their formation. And then even closer, right? Maybe some have already formed by then. So in this way, we can somewhat get an idea, or we're trying to get an idea still, I guess, of how galaxy formation happens. Like many things, it's difficult. And the book presents some ideas on like how we think galaxies form, but it also is careful to kind of like say, this is what we think, because honestly, we don't really know all that well how galaxies form. Right? We're still trying to suss that information out. One thing that seems to contribute or be a part of it in some way are these supermassive black holes. Right? But in fact, at the center of Andromeda, there's also a supermassive black hole. Right? At the center of many galaxies that we've looked at, we have found supermassive black holes. These millions to billions of times the mass of our sun. Exactly how the formation happens and whether like the black hole is a kind of the precursor or whether it forms in the process or sort of after the galaxy happens, we still don't know yet. Let's look at one idea though. This one is presented as like how galaxies might form and basically it's like a much bigger version of the solar system. When the solar system formed, there's all this gas and dust and uh, for whatever reason it reached a certain kind of critical density in order for gravity to really start collapsing it all together and the stuff given that it's kind of uh, randomly moving about uh, doesn't just collapse nicely all down together all right straight in it's kind of swirling around too so you get the stuff that's collapsing it still swirls around and around so this idea for galaxy formation is just kind of thinking about a single, very, very large sort of cloud of stuff collapsing in a similar way that our solar system did, but just on a much larger scale. This is one idea of how something forms, but it might even be like something like this, but there's other processes happening too. So you don't need to worry too much about answering any questions on like how does a galaxy form. Because basically what I'm telling you is we don't really know. So something at least though that we have found, at least about our galaxy, when we look out and we see this happening with other galaxies, is that one galaxy can kind of pull in and absorb material from other galaxies. So like our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a decent sized galaxy, as far as galaxies go, and throughout its evolution, throughout its time since it formed, it seems to have encountered other smaller galaxies, or pulled smaller galaxies in. And so the image here is showing, I think what they call these like streamers, which are sort of streams of these older galaxies that maybe were more clumped together, or had more form before they encountered our galaxy. But as they go through and go around the Milky Way, they start to get like pulled apart and stretched apart. And so the Milky Way starts pulling them into itself, and then pulling the original galaxy also into these sort of uh, orbital shapes now, streams around. And so from what we've observed now, it seems like the Milky Way has sort of done this, swallowed up these smaller galaxies, something like 50 times in, in the last 10 billion years. So yeah, that's a good amount of galaxies, but 10 billion years is a whole, like a long time. This image is actually showing sort of one piece of evidence for why we see these sort of streams, or we think that there are these smaller dwarf galaxies that have been sort of 
swallowed up by ours. That line here is the galactic plane. And the outline, that like bluish line, it's kind of like outlining the disk almost of the galaxy. And right when you get towards the center, it bulges out. You get that sort of bulge at the center. And so this red area is highlighting this other galaxy that has been sort of stretched apart. And part of one of these streamers that is formed when a smaller galaxy has gone through the Milky Way or been like uh, kind of swallowed through the Milky Way and gotten stretched out from these like elongated uh, sort of groupings of stars now. But you term this galaxy, uh, this smaller one, the Sagittarius galaxy. Again, because like this, looking towards this region is towards the center of the galaxy. It's near the constellation Sagittarius, so a lot of the stuff in that region gets named Sagittarius something. Sagittarius Report Galaxy. Yeah, I think we've seen this globular cluster before. Maybe it's M54. And it seems to be that this used to be part of that dwarf galaxy. It was swallowed up by the Milky Way and sort of pulled apart. And now it's sort of just part of the Milky Way galaxy. One of the globular clusters in the halo. So regardless of how galaxies form, initially, it seems pretty clear at least that this interactions of galaxies occurs fairly regularly throughout their lifetime. So whether or not it's like a big galaxy that sort of swallows up other galaxies, smaller ones, or it's one of those smaller ones that kind of gets pulled into a bigger one and sort of starts to get incorporated into it, that seems to be part of like the lifetime of the galaxy. And in fact, it seems that our galaxy, the Milky Way, and Andromeda, one of our neighboring galaxies I showed you just a little bit ago, are on a bit of a collision course. So don't worry, it's not going to be happening anytime soon. We think, at least, that they are coming closer together, and in something like three or four billion years, they're going to be close enough to start to interact and kind of mesh into each other in a way and sort of become one even larger galaxy. So here's a series of images trying to give an idea of what it, we would think the night sky might look like if you were around in about three or four billion years to see this event begin and then follow it all the way through. The first image is, you know, three to four, 3.7 over a billion years from now. So the Milky Way we still see on the right, but now Andromeda is so close that you actually see Andromeda in the night sky too. Over the next few like hundred million years, we go from like the picture two to three, where our galaxies are kind of passing through each other, colliding in a way, and the gravitational pull from all the stuff in one galaxy is pulling on all the stuff in the other galaxy. So they start to swirl around in this really chaotic sort of fashion. So you keep going, and it's just swirling around, and eventually you seem to think that they're going to kind of settle down into just being this sort of glob, spherical-ish shaped galaxy now. Right? By about 7 billion years, it will just have merged pretty much entirely. This is imagining if the Earth was still where it was in 3 billion years, and it still stayed roughly where it was through about 7 billion years. That's probably not going to happen. As I mentioned before, the sun is probably going to become a red giant somewhere around 5 billion years from now. When that happens, there's probably not going to be much left of Earth at all. It's either going to be inside of the sun or just kind of vaporized. Maybe vaporized. And also one other thing to note here is when you think about these galaxies colliding, right? the galaxies are just made up of a bunch of stars and gas and dust and quite a lot of empty space. You know, like even between our planet and the sun, quite a lot of empty space. And between stars, our star and the nearest star, a lot of open space. And so this collision is mostly a, a gravitational interaction. Right? They're not going to be necessarily a whole bunch of stars that are running into each other during this process. Right? They're just so much space that a lot of them are probably going to kind of just end up getting gravitationally uh, pulled around by each other, not necessarily collide. Though, when big clumps of gas or like molecular clouds, interstellar media, like swirl together, that stuff might tend to heat up a lot and get bursts of new star formation. So an interesting thing to think about, it's got a long time until it happens. Well, that's all I have about the Milky Way galaxy.
Um, next time we're going to keep talking about galaxies more. And yeah, that's it. So uh, I'll see you later.